We're going we're gonna to jump into singing and worship. I don't like calling it just worship. Because if you call this just worship, then it gives you an excuse to not live a lifestyle of worship, which Romans 12 calls you to live. Did you know that preaching the gospel is worship? You're glorifying Jesus in front of other people while you preach the gospel. Did you know while you give, you are honoring Jesus and saying you are more worthy than my finances, aka worship? So while we sing and worship... Um, I want you guys to keep a few things in your minds. You guys want to stand with me? Whoa. Did you see the Holy Spirit came in right when that just, sing? Joking. I personally am sick and tired of coming to Christian gatherings and Christian meetings and leaving the same. It has been far too normal for us as believers for us to go to a place to receive a word, to feel good about ourselves and our situation, or less good about ourselves and our situation, and leave at the same time completely the same as we did when we walked in the room. It shouldn't be that way if God shows up in here. If God doesn't show up in here, then it might be a reason for you to leave normal or the same. But if God shows up, how could you leave normal? I want to read you this from 2 Chronicles 7. It says, as soon Solomon dedicated the temple that he built and in David's dream, David's dream was to, instead of having God dwell in this tent, he wanted him to dwell in this temple, this building in Jerusalem. And Solomon built it and dedicated it. And here's what happened after he dedicated it. Second Chronicles 7 verse 1. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the the Lord's house. When all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord saying, for he is good and his steadfast love endures forever. Why I don't want to be charismatic Christian tonight where we say the fire's gonna fall and it's gonna be an exciting time. I think it's a cop out if I was just to say that tonight and just to move on. What if God really did show up and you left this place completely different? You repented, you rid yourself of your sin, you changed your lifestyle. You changed your job. You cha- God spoke something to you where you knew you had to do something. You couldn't stay the same. Lord, we ask for your fire to fall down and shock us tonight. Shock us tonight. We don't want to leave here tonight saying, in and out is the next home that I'm going to dwell in and I'm going to my bed after that. We want to leave this place different marked, moved, transformed. We want to have seen something, tasted something, felt something, heard something that we must act upon tonight in the name of Jesus. I don't like warm-up singing. First song, Lord, we love you, we bless you. Second song, Lord, we love you, we bless you. Third song, Lord, we love you, we bless you. Yeah, and then kind of the third song, you're stoked. Why not right away, on your knees, on your face, Jesus, we worship you. We worship you tonight, Lord, in the glory and the splendor of your majesty. Mark us, Jesus. You guys can come up front if you want.
Jesus. We bless your name, God. We bless your name in this place tonight.
cross. We thank you that the cross has brought us into a perfect relationship with God. That there's no more separation. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We bless your name.
I don't know if there's anything that brings me more courage and strength than singing with the saints. Some of it, just, something about just looking around and seeing you guys worshiping Jesus. I mean, you know most of your generation is not doing what you're doing right now. How does Jesus see you right now? How does he look at this room? Do some more stuff for me. Nice scowl on his face, frown. How do you view him? How, how do you see God tonight? I think, I think by the word of the Lord that Zach's gonna bring tonight, I do think that the Lord is gonna break some boxes and shatter some preconceived notions about who he is and what his power does. And for some of you that are younger in this room, I, I was in high school and I did a lot of drugs and I called myself a Christian at the same time. And I thought Christians that who raised their hand and sang were kind of weird and strange. And then when I got rocked when I was 18, there was nothing more I wanted to do than scream and shout and jump up and down. And I wanted to say to you tonight that are young in this room, which is all of you, you are normal. Your generation is abnormal. You are the normal ones worshiping Jesus. You are the one who are in the right place at the right time in this room. Nothing brings me more courage and strength than seeing you guys worship Jesus. Lord, we love you tonight, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. This is brother and uh, brother and sister combo right here, which is dope. This is Casey Brent. She's my sister-in-law. She has a TikTok, guys, and I think one of her videos just blew up. What's your, what's your handle? Casey Brent, you guys should go follow her on TikTok. Exciting. Um, we have a couple announcements before we get into the message. Um, for many of you in this room, I'm going to say this very boldly and bluntly. Coming to Christian gatherings and coming to Sunday services is not enough to foster a relationship with Jesus that lasts you 60 years. Remember, we as circuit riders are not trying to host gatherings and host Monday nights so that we can have our ears tickled and we can move on with our lives. And you never remember what happened to you in this room. And what happens in this room doesn't affect you for 60 years. That's our goal in this room every time we come in here is to have that kind of effect. And I'll say this too. One of the things that we need as believers is to be trained is to be motivated and trained and to actually sit under people who've gone before and who have done great things for Jesus and actually know how to give to you so that you can do the same in your generation. Training is one of the main things, main avenues that we as circuit riders utilize in order to reach our generation. We as leaders can't just one school at a time. Here we go. Another circuit rider runs over there. Did you guys know the original circuit riders in the 1700s, all, most of them died before they were 33? Why? Because they, they all were just going nuclear, running around the country on their horses, and they got bit by snakes and starvation, and it was too cold, and they broke their bodies before 33. That's exciting to us. Trust me. For me, that's exciting. I'd love to be that guy. But wouldn't it be easier if we as believers didn't rely on people externally from our situation, and we in our situation were the one who was affecting things around us. You need to be trained in order to do that. So we have some summer schools uh, that we're announcing. We're actually changing it up a little bit this year. If you've been to 21 Project before, it's not called 21 Project anymore. It's just circuit rider schools. It's exciting. Krista, do we have the videos? From the beginning, the dream was young people reaching their generation with the message of Jesus, with practical action and prayer, not waiting for a solution. 
but carrying solution to a world in need. We are going back to our roots, but bringing everything we learned along the way. Each Circuit Rider School is comprised of four key elements. Corporate training and worship, outreach and evangelism, activation into real movements, and being equipped with practical skills. This is for the revivalists, the evangelists, the influencers, and the doers. The people who are ready to change the world. Let's check. Let's go. We have two university schools as of right now for the Americans. Orange County, California, which is the present place that you're residing in. Very cheap for you. Um, and then we have Dallas, Texas. Texas is another country. I love that country. It's a great place. Um, great tacos, great everything. Everything's big, um, including the people. Oh, gosh, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, joking, but maybe not. Um, and then for high schoolers, raise your hand if you're a high schooler in here. Give me a wave. Shout out. Okay, we have three. Is it three schools? Three, three schools, Kona, Hawaii. Oh, what a bummer. Jeez, suffering hardcore right there, guys. Kona, Hawaii, who would want to go there for, uh, you know, what would you do this summer? Oh, I just sat around and played video games and watched TikTok and avoided the sunlight as much as possible. What would you do? I went to Hawaii and got trained in the gospel. Now I'm going to come back and detonate your face off with the gospel. Here we go, right? Okay, so Hawaii, we've got Orange County, we've got Dallas, Texas as well. So if you're a university student, you're a young person, you want to take a week off or 10 days off from your job or whatever it is, come and join us for a circuit, tr circuit rider training this summer. Amen? Yeah. Okay, all right. You said amen, which means agree, so that means you're coming. That's good. Okay, we're going to jump into the message here. We have a new uh, guest. He's not new, but he's new to Monday nights. His name's Zach. He's here. He's, he's new to many of you. He's going he's gonna to find a tender place in your heart tonight. Don't worry. Before I introduce him. He's a dear, dear brother, friend of mine. Before I introduce him, I just want to read a Bible verse to you. Um, sometimes we in the audience will test a preacher before we give a pre the preacher our trust and our affection and before we actually decide to buy into what he's saying or she is saying. I'll explain this a little bit deeper. When we look at a preacher, right, we're like, oh, does he say it right? Does he, does, he, does he give me that extra sauce on there that just makes me go, yeah, that's awesome. That analogy was just butterlicious, and I loved it. Now I'm going to buy in, right? We do this because we don't understand that Jesus, more than giving messages that were dialed in with all these analogies, he actually told people that if you don't understand my message, it's because you're not hearing properly. And instead of it being just about the preacher having to say everything perfectly, he actually put it back on the audience and would say things like this. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let me read you this real quick. I'm setting Zach up here because he's going to bring the word of the Lord tonight. I really feel the Lord is going to meet you in a place tonight of his power. Luke chapter 8, verse 4. When a great crowd was gathering and the people from town after town came to hear him, and uh, hear him, he said a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell among the path and was trampled underfoot. And the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock. And as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among the thorns. And the thorns grew up with it and choked it and some fell among good soil and grew grew and yielded a hundredfold as he said the th said these things he called out he who has ears to hear let him hear what a strange message 2 minutes farming message you got ears you heard it good Doesn't that freak you out just a little bit that when Jesus was in front of the huge crowds, he would say the most audacious, ridiculous things and would give no explanation and would just put it on the audience if you have ears to hear. What's he saying? If you have spiritual understanding in your brain, in your heart, you'll get the message more than the preacher having to deliver it to you on a nice plate with a nice fork and a nice presentation and the nice everything and the nice filtered photo of it so that you can look on the menu and go, I want that. It's on us as the hearers to as well engage in the message tonight. Amen? So lean forward. Have your ears turned on to spiritual understanding. Zach, you want to come up? 
Zach's a dear, dear friend. Yeah, you can give him a, whoa, 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 whoa. Circuit rock, yes, 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 yes. If you, if you don't know, Zach leads all of our training circle and circuit riders, all the circuit rider experiences, all the things, circuit rider experience, shout out right now. Yeah, there you go. Zach leads all of that. He's a dear friend, a dear brother, and one of my favorite things is to sit and to hear him talk about Jesus because he has such deep revelation and he's a deep well, and I would really put him in the category of like a teacher, teacher, like that level. So, Z Nasty, bring it to us tonight. Thank you, bro. What an intro. Should just let Derek keep preaching. You guys doing good? Man, I could have kept worshiping like the whole night. Casey James, that was like, just took us to heaven, dropped us off, left us there. It was awesome. We'll jump back into worship um, afterwards. You know, okay, so we've been in this, if you haven't been with us the past few weeks, you've been in this series on the book of John. And so tonight we're gonna dig into John chapter six. And I always thought that when we were going to, you know, go through when Jesus said, eat my flesh, drink my blood, I always thought Derek would preach that message. So, but he's not. So I'll have to tackle that tonight. But I want to start off by saying this, that Jesus is a meal received, not earned. He's a meal received, not earned. So tonight you can eat your heart out of him. You can eat to your fullest desire that you want. However hungry you are, there's enough of him for you. If you're just a little hungry, he'll give you a little. If you're super hungry, he'll give you more. So you you don't have to work your way up. I don't care what you did this morning, what you did yesterday. He's not a meal that you have to earn. It's fully received. So tonight, I feel personally that there's an invitation for us to feast on Jesus. And we're going to talk about that. What does that actually look like? So if you've never really, if you've never read the Bible and you're here, you've never heard that, don't get freaked out when I say eat my flesh, drink my blood. We'll get into that. It's not really eating him. But there's a place where we partake of his presence. And I love how Derek opened, opened the night. I felt personally in my own life, kind of the last six months to a year, that you ever just kind of get tired of going through the motions and the ordinary results? I kind of have had this prayer in my heart where I'm saying, Lord, I'm, I'm asking that you would come and overshadow every previous idea of what I think the glory is. Like that you would overshadow the, the, my previous experiences in the presence, that you would come and bring that shock factor and that you would totally mess my life up. And I, I'm starting to believe that at any moment he actually can do it. I'm, I'm kind of getting to the place in my own life, my own walk with God, where I don't really want to just come in and be like, yeah, it's going to be a good night, maybe, you know, kind of be the cool guy, sit back. Like, I want to be the foolish guy in the front with expectation through the roof, believing that God can break through at any moment. Because if you read this book and you read these stories, you see that heaven invaded the most normal moments. Heaven broke in in the most, you know, typical, normal days. Heaven broke in and things changed. So my prayer tonight is that it would be one of those nights. Are you guys okay if we just kind of start off on that level? So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get started. Father, we love you, and we are grateful for your presence, and we ask that you would come and invade our hearts tonight. We ask that by the Spirit, You would open us up to revelation. You would open us up to encounter. We pray that you would come and that we would feast on you, that you would meet our hunger in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. All right, so here's the deal. The book of John is, is an encounter with Jesus. This whole book, like the, if you just want to like at the most simple you know, bottom ground level, this book is about an encounter with the man, Jesus. From chapter one, it states it at the very beginning, there's an exhortation, there's a direction that this book points us to, and it's behold the lamb. From the very get-go, from the beginning, John the Baptist says it, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of of the world. From chapter 1 to 21, that's the message, that's the theme, it doesn't change. Behold the Lamb. Just recently I was 
at a friend's house and I just visiting a friend, a different state, had never been to his house. So I got up to his house. You know, when you go to a friend's house, right? You've never been there, they show you around, right? Like you go in. So we go in the house and it's kind of this like, you know, you walk in on a level and there's like a few steps down, there's a living room. And then like through the kitchen, there's some stairs up to another level, you know, kind of three small levels of the house. It was an awesome house, beautiful house. We had done the tour, he showed me around. And then we get into this little bottom living room. We're sitting there and I'm like, okay, the tour's over. And then he goes, I think he's getting something out of the closet and he opens the door and there's stairs going downstairs. He's like, You'll, this is where you're gonna sleep. It's like, oh, there's more. So we go downstairs and there's a bedroom, there's a bathroom, there's this office. It's just this really cool downstairs that from the street view or from a surface level examination, you would not have known that that was down there. That's how the book of John is. When you read these texts and you read these stories and you get into it, all of a sudden what happens is the Holy Spirit opens a door and says there's deeper meaning. There's something deeper in this text. And all of a sudden, you know, you realize that this book wasn't meant to just be read at surface level. It was meant for you to go deep and have an encounter with the Lamb. It was meant for you to be able to get lost inside this text and find Jesus there. And you all of a sudden, you start reading the same story again and he opens another door. And before long, you're lost in the most beautiful way because you're realizing just how beautiful Jesus is. That's the book of John. That's what we're going through. That's why we, we chose this book. I, I, would, I would almost say that you could spend your entire life in this one book and you would never get bored. There would always be a new side of Jesus that you would experience. So tonight, I believe we're gonna encounter uh, a new side of him, and uh, it's gonna mark us, it's gonna change us. I, I wholeheartedly believe that. So we want to behold him. We want, that, we want that inner flame on the inside that never weakens, but only grows because we stay in a state of beholding, right? Like, you ever meet those people who kind of, you know, you kind of hear about like burnout or they kind of lose their way, lose their faith? Um, you know, maybe you've heard this line, familiarity breeds contempt. Who's ever heard that, that word, that line? That basically means like if I'm around Derek all the time, like, and I just get so familiar with him, I just, I know everything about him. All of a sudden, he kind of loses a little bit of like, you know, his greatness. He just becomes familiar, but I wanna say that if you continue to behold Jesus and you refuse to retire from beholding, familiarity will never quench fascination. You will forever be fascinated by Jesus if you refuse to retire from beholding him. So we're gonna dig in tonight. I'm excited. John is telling us in this chapter and through all the other chapters that the Lamb of God is the Son of God. The Lamb is the Son. So you can turn in your Bibles to John chapter six. And we're gonna go through um, this story that is in every gospel. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all record this event. So what you need to know right out of the gate is if every writer of the Gospels puts this in there, you need to pay attention. You need to pay attention because the Holy Spirit decided that it was needed for every account to have this story. So when you approach reading this story, you need to take a step back and say, okay, Holy Spirit is really wanting me to lean in because there's something key that I have to get from this. So this whole chapter, there's a lot in here, right? There's a lot of roundabouts, a lot of turns, a lot of corners, a lot of intersections. So we are not gonna exhaust this chapter. We're gonna hit some main points that I believe that the Lord highlighted. I'm gonna leave the rest to you to go back with and search out for yourself. But John chapter six, this is where Jesus feeds the 5,000. So starting at verse one in chapter six, we see after this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Now, I wanna stop right there and say this, that crowds never fed Jesus's ego. 
They didn't feed his ego, right? Like, you know, modern day, you know, young preacher would be, you know, be so, it'd be so hard not to get puffed up if you gathered thousands outside, right? Like you would be excited if you put on a gathering and thousands upon thousands came. You would, it would be hard not to get a little bit puffed up. Jesus, his ego wasn't fed by the crowd. When he saw a crowd, he was moved with utter compassion for people. Crowds to him were an opportunity for the kingdom to break in. The, the gospel of Mark tells us in this same account that when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. In this context, in, in Mark's gospel, in that context, it literally means like they were an army without a commander. They were a group of people without a leader. And Jesus had compassion. He was moved deep within. It wasn't, it wasn't just like, oh, I feel sorry for them. No, it was this deep guttural groan of like, I must do something. They're harassed. They're helpless. They think they know what they need, but they have no idea. They're confused. So what Jesus, what he begins to do to the crowds, as we see in Mark's account, is that he began to do two things. He taught and spoke of the kingdom, and he demonstrated the kingdom. He would teach and speak about the kingdom, and then he would say, okay, this is what the kingdom looks like. And it says he would heal their diseases. He would heal bodies. He would cure people. He wouldn't only just talk, he would demonstrate. I want to say to you tonight at the beginning of this night that the gospel actually works. The gospel actually works. The, the, the way God brings greater definition to the gospel is by demonstration. It's by demonstrating. It's not just someone can get up and wax eloquent and say awesome things and make someone go ooh and ah. It's that someone can actually stand before a person who's crippled and sick and they can lay their hands on them and say, in Jesus' name, be healed, and they're made whole. That's what happens throughout this entire book. May we never reduce Christianity to anything other than a demonstration of power, to change, to things not remaining the same. That's the gospel invitation is that everything can change by the power of Jesus. So when he saw crowds, he was moved with compassion. He taught the kingdom and he demonstrated the kingdom. Let's keep going. It says that Jesus went up on the mountain, verse three, and there he sat down with his disciples. Verse four says, the Passover, the feast of the Jews was at hand. Okay, quick comment on this. John, listen, when you're reading the book of John, you need to know every, every detail is important. He puts things in here that the other writers don't put in and they put things in that he doesn't put in. But he wants us to know that when this is happening, the Passover was at hand. And so when the Passover was happening, the Jews, follow me here, follow me in this, the Jews, they would, they would recollect when Moses delivered them, right? When Moses brought deliverance out of Egypt, they would think back on that time and recollect and remember the past deliverance. And they would also look forward to the future for the one who was to come that was like Moses, so that, that's the context when this is happening. The Jews are remembering and they're looking forward to the prophet to come who is just like Moses. Deuteronomy 18, 15 says that for the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. They were looking for a prophet who would bring deliverance and would bring manna from heaven. That's what, that's what they were looking for. You're gonna find it, I find it really fascinating to see how many things Jesus is actually doing behind the scenes in this one story. It's incredible. We're gonna, we're gonna dig into it here. So that's the context. They're, they're looking for this. And so Jesus knows that that's what's happening. And so he uses this opportunity to say, I'm going to reveal myself as the greater Moses. They think they know what they're looking for, but they have no idea. He says, I'm gonna reveal myself as the greater Moses. There is no life in the bread of the law. I'm gonna say it again. There is no life in the bread of the law. Jesus is coming to bring life. 
We talked about this when we went over John chapter three. He talks about, you know, eternal life is the word used throughout the John's gospel. Can I explain to you what eternal life is? Eternal life is the life of the age to come gets pulled in and put inside your body. Come on, no, listen, listen. It's not a prayer to go to heaven. Don't reduce the gospel to a magic prayer that one day everything's gonna be okay. Yes, you're gonna go to heaven, but the reality is is that the life of the age to come gets sucked into the here and now, put inside your body, and you get to experience resurrection life on earth. You become the channel for heaven to invade situations. Jesus said, as the Father sends me, so I send you. What does that mean? You're his representative. The things he did, so shall you do. Let's not wait until that day to be rescued out of the earth. Let's press in now and say, we have the life of the age to come at our fingertips. It's within, it's here, it's now. Verse five, lifting up his eyes, And seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Okay, Jesus has been teaching a massive crowd all day. I'm talking thousands, right? Like we're gonna see there's 5,000 men that are counted, but there's probably 15 to 20,000 people there. So that's that's a lot of people. That like, picture that in your mind. You've been teaching them, you've been healing the sick, all day, the the context that Mark tells us is that what happened was the disciples were sent out by Jesus. He sent them out to cast out demons. He sent them out with authority. So they had just come back to Jesus. Anybody ever gone on a missions trip? Raise your hand high. Uh, Okay, who's ever worked like a 40 hour a week job? Who's ever worked 20 hour a week job? Okay, I think we covered everybody. So everyone knows what it's like to put in some work, to put in a long day. They have been out on a ministry trip. Jesus just said, here, I'm gonna give you my authority. I'm gonna chuck you out. And I want you to go and proclaim the kingdom. And I want you to heal the sick. And I want you to cleanse the lepers. And then you're gonna come back. So this, the context is that they had just come back from this trip. So they are tired. If anybody's ever been on outreach, you come back, you're tired. You just wanna get in your bed, You just maybe want to get some in and out You maybe want to get some Chick-fil-A. You don't want to talk to anybody. You may want to go see a movie by yourself. You just kind of want to rest and be alone. So Jesus is taking his guys off to rest. That's where they're going. And the crowds show up. Okay, think about it. They know Jesus. They've been with him enough to know, dang it. Here it goes. Compassion, Mr. Compassionate. We're not gonna rest, I'm not gonna get my sleep. So that's, that's the disciples' mindset, they're tired. And so Jesus looks at them and he says, hey, they're hungry. They've been here with us all day. And the disciples say, well, this, there's nothing out here. We're in the middle of nowhere. We're in a desolate place. There's no food out here, Jesus. We, we've run out of resources. We're, we've, we've given everything we have to give. Send them away. That's their words. Send them away so that they can buy food for themselves in the surrounding villages. Now, probably you and I would say the same thing. We would say, send them away. We don't have anything for them. There's nothing out here. We would use that as like, we're being, we're being compassionate. Jesus, send them out. Let them get food. But Jesus, you see, He's also training his men at the same time that he's revealing himself. He's revealing himself to the crowds while at the same time, he's training his disciples to be leaders. Jesus is the master trainer. So they're tired, but he wants them to know, listen, when revival breaks out, rest goes out the window. Come on, if you're praying for revival, you need to know that you're gonna become exhausted. When bodies start getting healed, don't you think sick people are gonna line up around the door? What do you think? It's just all of a sudden, like somebody's gonna stand up out of, start standing up out of wheelchairs and, and nothing's gonna happen. No, when that type of power breaks out, when you start casting out demons, when the sick are healed, when the dead are raised, I'm telling you, you will not have rest. People will be knocking at your door 24-7. Jesus knows, listen, 12 
You're not gonna have rest. You're actually gonna build my church. I need you to get a greater understanding. I need you to see where to actually draw your strength from. What happens is we get tired. We get what we call, we call it swirled out. So you can be in a good swirl or a bad swirl, okay? Good swirl is like you had five dreams, you're going down the road and you see a sign that was in your dream and then someone texts you a verse that you were meditating on that morning and then your friend calls and I got a prophetic word for you and they give you a verse and all of a sudden you're in this swirl, right? That's a good swirl. A bad swirl is when you're tired and you're, you're just, you don't really wanna, you don't really wanna keep, you know, feeding people or, or serving, so you kind of pull back and your kind of response is send them away. But Jesus is saying, no, don't stop serving. Change your perspective. Come on, if you're in a, if you're in a swirl where you, you kind of like, I just, ah, I'm just kind of gonna rest, I need to preserve myself. No, he's saying, don't stop serving. Change your motive. Don't stop serving. Change where you're drawing your strength from. He's saying, you, you need to understand that if, you, if you're pulling on your own strength, yes, you will burn out every time. But he said, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the well that never runs dry standing in your midst. You can, you can have all the strength you need if you'll just tap in to the right reservoir. It's Jesus. So they said, send them away. There's no food out there. But he, he insists you give them something to eat. You know what happens often is that when we don't understand what, what's happening or we don't feel like we have control or authority or we're kind of operating out of our own human strength, you know, what, you know what we tend to do as humans? We kind of push things aside. We say someone else will take care of it. I don't want to take responsibility for this. Send them away. In Mark chapter five, just a, a, a Mark chapter six is this story. Mark chapter five, there's a story of the, you, we guys know, you guys know about the demoniac who had all these demons and he lived out in the tombs. And it says, I wanna read this to you because it, it's, it's really profound. In Mark chapter five, it says that they came to the other side of the sea and Jesus stepped out of the boat and immediately there met out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. No one had the strength to subdue him. So here's, here's the storyline, right? You've got this guy who's so demon-possessed, who's tormented to the core. People, they do not know what to do with them. Out of their own human reasoning and human resources, they basically look at this man and say, you are as good as dead. You're a dead man walking. We're putting you out in the tombs, relegating you to the graveyard. You're dead. There's no hope for you. We can't do anything. We have no more strength to bind you. So in all honesty, out of their own human reasoning, they left him in a, in a worse state than before. They secluded him. That's, that's when we operate out of our human strength. But do you know what happens when mercy steps on the shore? Can I read to you what happens when mercy encounters this man? You see, 5 verse 4 is human leadership. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched them apart because no one had the strength to subdue him. That's when you lead out of your own strength. Verse 24 5.24 says this. Let's see, is it 24? No, 15. They came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, sitting there clothed and in his right mind. Human strength leaves them worse than before. The power of the Spirit operating through mercy leaves him clothed and in his right mind. That's the power of the gospel. Jesus is trying to get his guys to understand if you do it in your own strength, you'll have no authority. If you draw from me the reservoir of life, I promise you, I promise you, things will change. Mercy works different. Mercy works different. Man's extremity, when you have nothing else to give, when man's extremity is at the forefront, that becomes God's opportunity. 
Go ahead and rid yourself of all of your strength and fall at the mercy of Jesus and watch him blow through your life and miracles start happening. Why? Because you're depending on the power of the Spirit. Go back to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 9. So he asks them, where are we to buy bread so these people may eat? They tell him, listen, Jesus, we could have eight months worth of salary. We could have eight months of money, and it still wouldn't be enough to feed this crowd. It wouldn't be enough. Chapter 6, verse 9 says, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. What is that for so many? Barley was the, the poor man's bread. It was, it was what the poor people ate. These two fish were probably very measly fish. He's saying, there's thousands of people here, Jesus. Thousands. We got five loaves of bread, two little fish. What in the world is this going to do? Jesus takes the loaves he looks up, he blesses them, and he feeds the multitudes through five loaves of bread and two fish. So often, we focus on our lack and what we don't have, and we are unable to perceive the word of the Lord to us in that season. Listen, you gotta catch this. Jesus, is, he's, he's, he's trying to break through their current understanding. He's saying your focus is on what you don't have. That's called unbelief. When, if you read in, in uh, Mark's gospel, Jesus feeds 5,000 and then he goes on to feed 4,000. There's another account where he feeds another 4,000. And then it says that all the disciples get in the boat. This is after 9,000 people have been miraculously fed they get in the boat, they're with Jesus, and they start complaining and grumbling and worrying because they forgot to bring bread. 9,000 were just fed miraculously, five loaves, two fish. We don't have any bread, what are we gonna do? There's 12 of us, right? That, come on, like, do you see the dichotomy there of human thinking Versus Jesus. Yeah. Human thinking, I'm focused on what I don't have. Jesus, I'm in the boat with you, dude. Don't you remember? Because he says to him, beware of the yeast and the leaven of the Pharisees. And they start complaining about bread. He's like, I wasn't talking about bread. I was talking about the teaching of the Pharisees. I said, beware of that. You're so stuck on what you don't have. You can't properly hear my word to you. If you're in confusion in a season, take a step back and chances are your focus is on the wrong thing. Your focus is on what you don't have as opposed to who is in the boat with you. That's why in John, after this, we see the story where they go, they're on the boat in the water, the waves are crashing, the wind's in resistance. Jesus is walking on water, he gets in the boat, and it all calms, it all stops. What's the point? Why did John put that right smack dab in the middle of feeding the 5,000s and the bread of life discourse? Because he's saying, if I'm in the boat, it's okay. Doesn't matter what you're going through. If I'm in your boat, there's provision for you. There's life for you. That's the point. So that's all we're gonna say about walking on water. We don't have time to get into that. All right, we good? So he's trying to tell them, if what you do have, if you'll just focus on what you do have, this little bit, if you'll just put it in my hands, I'll multiply your efforts. If you'll take the, the little bit of talent and skills that you have, and if you give them to me, I will multiply it. I'll put my spirit on it. I'll give it back to you, and you'll see signs and wonders. In Exodus chapter 4, this is when God is, is calling Moses to be the deliverer for a nation, and he has this shepherd's crook. He has his staff. It's so all he has is this wooden stick that he's carrying around. It's a, it's a normal thing for a shepherd to have. God tells him to throw it on the ground. He throws his staff on the ground. It becomes a snake. Then he has him pick it back up. What's the point? The point is God can take an ordinary piece of wood and turn it into a tool for deliverance and authority to lead a nation out of slavery. What's the point? 
Let God set apart and sanctify what little you do have. If you give it over, he'll put his anointing and his power and his authority on it and you'll realize it's not dependent on you. It's dependent upon it being in Jesus' hands. That's the point. Five loaves, two fish, plenty. Plenty for Jesus. Plenty for Jesus. He wants to change our focus. So the food is multiplied. Let's keep going here. The food is multiplied. Now, John says that, that Jesus took the food and distributed it. He's trying to make a point here that Jesus performed the miracle. John doesn't want anyone else getting credit for this miracle. Jesus is the one who multiplies the food. You'll see that all throughout John's gospel. You even see that when you ever wondered why none of the disciples were killed or hung on the cross next to Jesus because God did not want there to be any confusion about who made atonement for the sins of the world. He wanted no man, no disciple next to Jesus. It's Jesus and Jesus only. That's why he's saying in here that Jesus did the miracle. But the other gospels, they tell us that he, he broke the bread and then he gave it to the disciples to distribute. And the disciples went around and handed out all the food. Jesus blesses the world through disciples. Jesus blesses the world through disciples, through followers, through people who are yielded to him. He performs multiplication through the hands of the disciples. And you know what it says? It says, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. Verse 13, so they gathered them up and they filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. What's the point? The point is that they had more than they began with. The point is that they picked up more than what they started with. There's a Proverbs, Proverbs 11, I think it's 25, says that he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. He who refreshes others will he himself be refreshed. When you get caught up into the, the negative swirl and the tiredness and the kind of the fatigue, you're not really wanting to do anything Maybe just take a, take a second to read the scriptures and realize that, oh, the Bible says if I refresh others, if I give my life away, I myself will be refreshed. So often the swirl comes because we're focused on me instead of the world around me where I can be a, a, a well of refreshment, a channel, an avenue for the multiplication of grace and bread to a hungry people. Jesus is saying, there's more than enough for you. There was 12 disciples, there was 12 baskets left over. Jesus is saying, look, you were tired. You went out, you cast out devils, you worked miracles, you're so exhausted, guess what? You're still serving, but I have more than enough for you. I have more than enough for your needs. Don't stop serving, change your source, change your reservoir. So we have this miracle. What's the point? What's, what's the ultimate point, though, that John's saying? So we pull all that out, but why this story? Why is it in every, every gospel? Why is, what is, what is John trying to get us to understand? In verse 22, it says that the next day, the crowd came over, and, you know, Jesus had, he'd walked on the water, Got in the boat, went over, they didn't know how he got there. So in verse 25, it says, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus, in his true fashion, does not answer their question. I love that about Jesus. So many questions get asked to him and he just totally avoids it, says something totally different. It's awesome. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. They said, and what must we do to be doing the works of God? So basically their question is, what kind of work does God require for us to get this food? 
What kind of, what, what do we need to do? What kind of work is there? In John chapter four, there's the same scenario. The woman, what must I do? Give, give me this water you speak of. What do I need to do? What's the, what's the work that God requires? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. Jesus is a meal received, not earned. He's a meal received, not earned. They, they came to him because they're, they, they liked that their bellies were full of bread. They liked the provision. That's, they, they liked the prosperity they received. But the gospel is not about you prospering with material goods. The gospel is not you, about you having a nicer house. The gospel is not about you even necessarily having a better future. The gospel doesn't promise you all these nice things. The gospel promises you the true bread of life, which is Jesus. He promises you himself. Verse 28, they said, oh, we already said that, verse 30. What sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So they said, sir, give us this bread always. They still aren't understanding. So he says to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never hunger. Thirst. I'll never cast this person out who comes to me. I am the very bread of life. You're looking for Moses. I'm greater than Moses. Moses didn't bring you bread. God gave you bread. I am the bread now that has come down from heaven. I am the life that you're longing for. I open up my hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Verse 40 says, this is the will of my father that everyone who looks on the son and believes in him should have eternal life. How do you get that life of the age to come inside of you? You look at Jesus and believe. You behold, you behold the lamb. You, to behold means to be apprehended by, to be caught up in. You become raptured in thought at the beauty of God hanging on a tree for you. You become caught up in the fact that the very bread of life can sustain you and give you a feast free of charge. Everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. He's saying the manna that your fathers ate in the wilderness spoiled. When you know, when they were complaining to Moses about food, you should have left us in Egypt, blah, blah, blah. God gives them this flake of a thing. They said, what is this? Manna every morning, and he let them gather. But they could only gather so much for that day, and the next day the leftovers would spoil. And in the end, they all, all, they all died. Jesus is saying, they died in the wilderness, but the bread that I am, will never spoil, it's eternal. And it feeds your soul, not your belly. It feeds your soul, not your belly. I am the bread that has come down from heaven. If you go down a little bit to verse 52, the Jews uh, disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. What is he saying? He, whoever comes to me, whoever comes to me and believes on me has eternal life. A lot of people were in close proximity to Jesus. A lot of people brushed against his shoulders. A lot of people bumped into him on the road, but only few maybe one that we know of, bumped into him, touched him, and power flowed through him. 
What was the difference? A lot of people touched him. A lot of people walked by. Multitudes walked by. Crowds would gather around him. But only one was able to cause virtue to flow through him when he wasn't paying attention to her. Well, you ever thought about that? What, why not everyone else? Many were intrigued, but few were desperate. Desperation is the key to the kingdom. Hunger is the key to seeing the kingdom unlocked in your life. My question to you tonight is how hungry are you? How hungry are you? What's your expectation level at tonight? What's your expectation level like day to day? If, if my expectation level is low, I can be intrigued by Jesus, but power is not flowing. If my expectation level is flow is, is low, I'm not gonna get up early in the morning to meet with him because I don't really think he's gonna meet with me. I'll just see it as a religious duty, a religious obligation. I need to check that box. Jesus is not in the, the box checking religion. He's into hunger. He's saying, I'm bread from heaven and I can feed you. Come to me. Come to me. Come to me and believe. You see, we, we get desperate for a season and, and then we get a little bit of relief and then we stop pursuing. Come on, we're all guilty. We get desperate, we get in a pickle, right? We need that bill paid or we messed up this relationship or we did this thing wrong and all of a sudden we'll, 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 we'll shift it into fifth gear. and We're, we're desperate. And then we get a little bit of relief. Our, our circumstances maybe change a little and then we kind of let off the gas. Why is that? It's because we have the wrong goal. We have the wrong pursuit. The, that pursuit is, is a changed situation, a changed circumstance. Jesus is saying, I need to be your pursuit. I am the bread. I am the bread that will satisfy I am the bread of eternal life. I am the one who can give you what you're looking for. Desperation is the key. Well, you know, a, a well-meaning, good-intentioned, you know, person won't sit at the feet of Jesus very long, but a desperate person, a desperate person will sit there and wait. A desperate person can cause virtue to flow out of Jesus. Many intrigued Few were desperate. So his invitation to them, to us, to the world, come to me. I am the bread of life. Can we have the band come on back up? I wanna, I wanna open this up a little bit of time because I really believe tonight that there's an invitation for you. There's an invitation for you. And I can't tell you, I don't, I don't know where you're at in life. I don't know what you've been going through. I don't know what you're going through right now. And I'm, I'm not gonna be naive enough to tell you that, I, that you, the outcomes are gonna change or that your circumstances were gonna change or that, you know, I can't tell you that your bank account's gonna grow. I can't tell you that those relationships are gonna work out. I can't tell you, you know, A, B, C, and D, but I can tell you one thing. I can tell you one thing from this text that there's bread for you if you're hungry. That Jesus can meet your need. It's, the Bible says that he opens up his hand and he satisfies the desire of every living thing. He is, he is absolutely concerned and consumed with you. His passion for you overflows. He, he's waiting for desperation to hit your heart for you to come to him to believe that he is who he says he is so that he can feed you, that you can feed on him. So I can't promise you all your situations and circumstances will change. They might, they might not. But I can promise you that Jesus wants to meet you and clothe you with power. He wants you to take your focus off of what you don't have and put it on what you do have. In Acts chapter three, Peter and John are walking to the temple and they go past the gate called Beautiful. And there's a man sitting there. He's lame, 
and he's begging and he's asking for money. Peter says, look at me, look at me. And they look at, he looks at Peter. He says, I don't have silver or gold, but I do have something. I often wonder if Peter's looking back to this moment when the bread of life multiplied food for the crowds. If in that moment he remembered the lesson that his master taught him. If he remembered in that moment that, oh, you know, I don't actually have resources for him. I can't actually give him something that he's asking for. But you see, the gospel doesn't just give something to someone and leave them in the condition that they're in. He said, oh, but see, I do have something for you that won't leave you in this current state you're in. It'll actually transform your life. So silver and gold, no, I don't have it for you. But what I do have, I give to you. Stand up, walk. And he was fully healed. Why? Peter's perspective, his focus changed. He knew the bread of life, that there was healing in that bread. There's healing in that bread. There's wholeness in that bread. There's, there's forgiveness of sin in that bread. There's eternal life, the, the life of the age to come. Healing can be brought into the here and now. Why? Because bread from heaven has come. God told Moses in Exodus 3, says, I've heard the cry. I've seen the affliction. I've come down to deliver. That's who he is. That's who he is for you. That's who God is for you. He's the God who comes down to deliver. He's the bread of life for you. I really believe that tonight God wants to meet you and mark you and ask you to stand with me. I believe there's power that can touch your body and change you if you are sick, if you need healing. I believe the bread of healing is here for you. If you're caught in sin and you're caught in, in this pursuit and you don't know how to, how to get saved, you don't know what to do, I believe the bread of salvation is here for you. If you're just hungry for more of God, there's a feast for you. Tonight is the night where the water turns into wine for you. Where the, where the, the religion that maybe you were brought up in all of a sudden the wine of the spirit gets poured out on your life and you're messed up forever. Come on, I believe that God wants to meet you. So my question is, how hungry are you? How hungry are you tonight for the bread? How hungry are you for him to come and meet you? Is your expectation level up here that he can do it? So I wanna ask you if you're hungry, if you want to feast on him, I want to invite you to come forward. I want to pray for you. I want to lay hands on you. I want to believe that God wants to mark you. Wherever you're at across the spectrum, if you're just hungry for more, if you need healing, if you need forgiveness of sin, if you just need a fresh touch, if you've been drinking the water of religion and you're ready for the wine of the Spirit, I want to invite you to come because God wants to meet you. Father, we pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would rush in this place, that you would come down, the bread from heaven, the bread of life, that you would come and that everyone who's up here would begin to feast on you. Holy Spirit, those who need healing, I pray right now that by the power of the Spirit, if you need healing in your body, can you just raise your hands to heaven right now? Holy Spirit, I pray right now for the bread of heaven, the healing power of God to flow we say be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. If you need the assurance of the forgiveness of sin in your life, if you, if you tonight know I need salvation, I need this bread from heaven, just raise your hand real quick and wave it so we can see if that's you. I just wanna pray for you. Come on, come on. Jesus, we pray right now for our sister, that you would just release the forgiveness, Lord, right now, that you would give her the assurance in Jesus' name that our sins are forgiven by the blood of Jesus. 
Come, we're gonna go into worship. I want you to fix your eyes on heaven. He is your portion. He is what you get. Jesus, we love you. We exalt you. We fix our eyes on the Lamb and we behold you. Come on, just in your own words, just begin to ask Him to come. Just begin to ask Him to touch you. Begin to ask Him to flood your body with the Spirit of God. We pray for the wine of heaven, the bread of life to be released in Jesus' name. I just feel that there's some of us in the room where you're longing for God to work in signs, wonders, you're longing for miracles to flow through your life and you have been, there's been a ceiling put over your life by a couple different things, what people have said about you, what you've chosen to believe about yourself, for the way you were brought up, for a whole number of reasons, but I believe that tonight 
You stepping out, I believe God wants you to, to, to step out and to ask for a baptism of power over your life that you would, you would come to know that has nothing to do with you, that you would become a yielded vessel that the power of God could flow through your life. If that's you, if you're in this room and you've been longing to see that, I wanna ask you to come forward, I wanna pray for you. We wanna ask God to deposit in you a, a boldness and a power to see signs and wonders, to see the kingdom break out. So if that's you, can you just come, come up here and come to the center up here? Just wanna get some of our staff, maybe Ian, Derek, whoever's in the room. We wanna pray for you, just kinda of line up. I really believe that tonight, there's, there's a breaking of the box where you thought it depended on you. But tonight, the water of that religion turns into the wine of the kingdom and I believe that the Spirit is gonna clothe you. It's gonna clothe you with power. So we're gonna pray for you. We just continue to worship, continue to fix your eyes on Jesus. We just wanna lay hands and pray that God would fill you with boldness. So if our crew can just start praying for people, Holy Spirit, we pray, come right now. Come right now, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit and power.
this place here, the last thing I feel is I, re I really feel that there's some in the room that you've been wondering if you can make it the long haul, that you feel this call, that you're supposed to be a full-time missionary, that you're meant to give your life for the gospel in full-time ministry, full-time missions work. Maybe you've been doing it for five years, maybe you've been doing it for a few months, maybe you've never done it, but you're, you're under the impression that you just don't have what it takes to make it the long haul that you've been drawing your strength from the wrong source. And I pray, I just believe tonight that God's gonna meet you if you're in that place, that he's gonna show you the reservoir of strength and grace that he is as the bread of life. So if you've been in that place, just so we can see, so we can pray for you. If, if you've been in that place, can you just raise your hand up? We wanna pray for you. If you've been in that zone where you said, I don't know if I can make it. Come on, some of our staff, you see these hands, we want you to come and lay hands. Holy Spirit, I just pray for every hand raised right now that the reservoir of grace would be tipped over and spilled out in Jesus' name. God, that every heart that has said, I long to do this, but I don't know if I have what it takes, I pray right now that you would release grace upon grace upon grace in Jesus' name. Right now, the love of God would crash in on your heart. In Jesus' name, let his love, let his love be the fuel. Let his love be the fuel of your life, the fuel of your mission in Jesus' name.
Let's, let's end this way. Would you turn to your uh, neighbor next to you and just lay your hand on them and ask for the empowerment of the Spirit to walk out what Zach called you to tonight, which is to go out there and, and not pretend, oh, I was hungry in a meeting and Zach inspired me in the meeting. But out there you go and you're just as hungry when you're hungry for steak, don't you want to tell other people, I'm hungry for steak. I'm hungry for in and out So when you're hungry, other people hear and know about it because your tummy, for some reason, comes to your brain and says, tell other people, you want in and out And so if it's that way with food, why would it not be that way with Jesus? I'm so hungry for him. Do you want to meet him too? And be empowered in that principle of hunger leads to evangelism, leads to you reading your word, leads to prayer, leads to better relationships, leads to all the godliness that we long and seek for in our lives. So pray for that person that the Holy Spirit would now empower them as they leave this building. In Jesus' name, Lord, we ask for it. Empower every single person. Empower every single person to live this lifestyle of hunger for Jesus, to feed on Him daily. In Jesus' name. Monday nights aren't a nesting place where you come and just get fed, but it's actually a launching pad. And so honestly, I'd love to hear testimonies from your guys' lives. Some of you I know, some of you I don't know, but can you give me a little wave? Give me a little wave, guys. If you have preached the gospel since you started coming to Monday nights, can you give me a little wave? You've preached the gospel. Can you give me a little wave if you've started to disciple someone around you? Give me a little wave. That's epic. I would love to hear those testimonies personally. So next week, you find me, you find another leader, and we want to start to hear what God's doing in and through you guys outside of this place. Amen? Amen. Okay, we love you guys. Have an amazing night. If you go to in and out after this, preach the gospel and do something nuts for Jesus. Amen. Love you guys.